Risk management is at the heart of what we do. Our deep-rooted industry and technical expertise enables us to manage the unique risks your business faces. Well, the past year has been a challenging one given the global coronavirus pandemic. But what can businesses learn from it, particularly when it comes to the risk landscape and how executives need to respond to increased risk? We unpack this in detail on this episode of The Role of Insurance, brought to you by Santam Specialist Insurance. And joining me to discuss the complex risk landscape we're seeing unfold is SHA Risk Specialist Business Head of Digital and Financial Lines, Simon Coleman, and Underwriting Head of of liability, Manisha Shiman. Uh, Simon, Manisha, thanks so much for your time today. So Manisha, uh, let's start off with you. SAJ has put out the annual specialist risk review and we're delving into that because there's a wealth of information uh, in that review and your um, chapter that you authored was entitled Adapting to a Complex Risk Landscape. So is COVID uh, at the heart of this or is it really too simplistic to lay all the complexity of the changing risk environment at the pandemic's feet? So, um, you know, personally, I don't think COVID is just the only source of this changing risk landscape. What we've seen over the last couple of years is that the risk landscape has been escalating. We're seeing an increase in claims, in claims quantums. So just to give you an idea, you know, from our own statistics, we've seen the average personal injury claim grow from 2016 to 2019 by 200%. Um, and this is not as a result of COVID, this is pre-COVID. I think what COVID has highlighted is that there is a need for strong risk management, for adaptation of business, and that needs to be taken into account when evaluating risk overall. Simon, that's very true what Manisha has picked up there. It's that um, while COVID might have added to the risk landscape, it certainly opened the eyes of businesses uh, to the risks that are out there, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> I think most businesses, like the insurance companies, didn't see COVID coming. Um, so if there's anything that we've learned from that is that you really need to expand your thinking when you're imagining what the risks are that are facing your business. You know, we spend a lot of time as, as insurers looking backwards. We base a lot of our decision making on history. Uh, and when something pops up, like COVID did, I think it, it kind of took everybody by surprise and we certainly hadn't been pricing or developing insurance products for that. But you know, what, what Manisha is talking about is interesting because what you're really talking about is, is changes in the way that the population thinks about litigation or about liability. So, you know, someone five years ago that injured themselves in a shopping center, for instance, might not have been so inclined to rush off to see an attorney. Um, they may have reported that they'd hurt themselves. But, you know, we're getting claims that are running into the hundreds. I mean, I saw a claim uh, a couple of weeks back that was 20 million for somebody that was injured in a, in a robbery outside a shopping center. So they weren't actually even on the premises. Um, so, you know, we, we're just seeing uh, people have definitely changed their perceptions. And business owners, I think, need to follow suit. They also need to start thinking a little bigger and broader than they did before. Absolutely. And we're going to get into the detail about that liability and that risk in a, in a short while. But Manisha, from where you sit, I want to know about the trends that you're seeing uh, develop in terms of cover. You'd expect increased cover given all the risks, but we have to deal with it in terms of this is a very tough economic uh, climate for businesses uh, to be operating in. So what trends are you seeing in terms of that? one of the biggest trends we're seeing is really a decrease in limit buying. So effectively, you know, clients are looking at their pockets, the economy is really tight, and there is a, a, an assessment of, you know, how much can I afford for the insurance. Um, I think the good thing as an insurer is that clients are not necessarily cancelling their insurance. So in the lines that we specialize in, it's very long tail business. You could have an intimation from, you know, 2010 only truly materializing and getting paid out this year. So because of that long tail nature, there's a really good understanding with clients to say, you know what, we'd rather reduce our limits and then buy up again over a period of time. 
Um, so I think it's, it's a strong sense of clients are acknowledging their own risk and that they need to actually have that risk transfer to the insurers as well. Manisha, we do talk about this um, difficult economic environment and how businesses are operating in that. And Simon kind of touched on this with uh, customers looking at, yeah. uh, you know, these slip and trip um, kind of claims that they're making. Uh, but it's, it's your workers as well that are getting desperate. Um, how are we seeing that translate into CCMA disputes? Are we seeing a rise there? Because if we are, it would... I would assume, in turn, uh, see an increase in employment practices liabilities. So you're very much on point there. I think one of the things that's happening in the tough economic environment is business are looking at restructuring or even going through very um, sensitive retrenchments. Now, if due process is not followed, what we end up seeing as a result thereof is a, an incline in the CCMA cases and disputes, which ultimately would filter down into your employment practices liabilities. Um, so I think, you know, over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of discussion or there's been a lot that's come to the forefront of companies restructuring and managing the expenses through this. In our own statistics, what we have found is that there is this rise in CCM cases, and we can see it's actually filtered through from a claims perspective uh, for unfair dismissal or the way the management or team actually handled the retrenchment process that it wasn't fulfilled completely. So uh, definitely an uptick. I do envision that that will continue into 2021 ultimately. So we're looking at increased risk from an employee perspective. We're looking at increased risk from business specifically. Uh, Simon, COVID, I would imagine, increases risk even more so because you talk about uh, the incident of someone getting shot outside a mall and there's a claim related to that. Uh, co with COVID-19, there's so many regulations that companies have to follow. Uh, does that increase risk uh, at all? Because businesses are going to have to ensure that they are so compliant with the regulations so that customers don't come back to them and employees don't come back to them as well. Yeah, look, they've had to expand their thinking to cater for COVID. But, you know, I mean, to approach this from a more positive angle would be to say, you know, having good access control into your premises, for instance. I, I arrived at our office this morning. I haven't been here for six months, actually. Um, there's a very stringent signing in process other than getting your temperature checked. Now, a lot of businesses got quite lax with those sort of things. So you, you have a better idea of who's coming in and going out. So even if you, if you said, you know, if COVID didn't happen, we should have been doing some of these things already. So I think that it, it certainly helped to, to, to focus the mind. Uh, what we haven't really seen much of, which I think is going to have to be looked at going forward, and that is the way that people are trained. Now, to, to follow on what, from what Manisha said, so you've got businesses that are downsizing their workforce. They're expecting the remaining staff to pick up the slack. So now you have somebody that might not necessarily be trained on how to operate machinery or how to generate a particular type of product. And, and that, of course, can, can turn into a liability incident and, of course, an injury to the employee uh, at some point down the line. So there's... There's a lot of thinking that's gone into COVID. There's a lot of trying to comply with regulations, but it, it's still got to be expanded further than that. Okay, so I like the little bit of a positive spin that we put on it in terms of keeping track of people, keeping track of who's coming in and out of your business. But what it does highlight, Manisha, to me is that it seems like the risk of litigation is certainly on the rise. Have businesses acknowledged that, though? So, you know, so this is a very interesting question, right? Because... Litigation is definitely on the rise. I think as Simon highlighted earlier, what we're seeing is consumers are just becoming so much more aware of their rights. They understand now how to get access to legal services. And so the claims are definitely coming in. From a business perspective, I think businesses have had to readapt their thinking. Well, how business was done on just a handshake has now evolved into making sure that they, they're documenting their relationships with partners in contracts because everyone is feeling that eco economic pressure. Um, so from my side, I actually think businesses are having to really evolve and really 
think about how they're managing risk and transferring risk, um, one of the biggest things I think that we're seeing overall from a business perspective is the diversification of businesses. So with COVID-19, we actually saw businesses really create different opportunities and, and expand their horizons, but that also meant, you know, an evolving risk landscape in, in their operations. Um, and that's really coming through in terms of, of how they look at it and, and how they take on risk. They do want to take on more de increased deductibles, increased risk exposure on their balance sheet. Um, and I think, you know, it's a reflective of the economy currently. Manisha, how critical does it then become for companies to keep a risk register? Are we seeing companies uh, do that? Uh, because it seems like at this point it becomes really, really crucial. So, you know, based on our research that we undertook in our survey, we found that actually 31% of companies do not want to share their risk register, but it is positive that there are risk registers on their horizons. Now, as an insurer, why do we want to see your risk register? You know, the guys that actually sit on a risk committee, those directors and executives, they have a very special role in their business. You know, they're really evaluating their business risks from all aspects, whether it's from health and safety, the CPA, food safety, et cetera. They're actually discussing that on a regular basis and they're actioning it. So as an insurer, why are we calling for risk registers? Or why do we want to actually see it? It gives us a view into the culture of that business. It gives us a view on how the client views their business. Um, I would say the emphasis is on actually clients moving towards a risk register, identifying their risks, and how do they manage it on an ongoing basis. Um, this can also include you know, maintenance and operations on a daily basis or weekly basis. You know, We tend to forget about those sort of aspects um, when we are you know, just trying to get through the day to day, but it forms a critical part of, of the environment. Simon, Manisha highlighting there just how crucial that risk register is. Why do you think they aren't being shared uh, with insurers? Because it sounds to me like it's like the ideal situation because then your insurer knows exactly where your weak points are, but also where you are actually doing uh, really well. Yeah, look, it's it's disturbing. I mean, you would you would hope that a that a business owner would want to share those things so that they can make sure that their policy is going to respond the way they think it should when something goes wrong. Um, but I I guess there's a there's a tendency to imagine that premiums are going to be you know increased or there's going to be some sort of punitive terms. But you know, not disclosing that stuff up front means that there's likely to be a claims problem. But I, I just want to postulate the whole thing by saying, you know, we, we, we're, we're moving in an in a insurance and client environment now that is definitely more adversarial than it has been in the past. There's been a lot of fallout because of the way that COVID was and the lockdowns were dealt with throughout the industry. So I think there's a lot of trust deficit um, that has to be rebuilt and, and, and that is certainly going to have to come primarily from the insurance companies. Um, but I think brokers are also going to have to step up and we have to really get back to that level where people understand what the benefits are and, and what the boundaries are of the insurance. It can't cover everything, unfortunately, because the price has to be fixed on a range of risks that we all understand. And we can only understand those risks if we see the risk, reg risk register. Um, so, so I do think it's, it's an open conversation. It's something that's going to have to be talked about a lot more. And we're certainly going to have to work harder to, to get to see those documents. And, and we're up for that. Well, we're going to have to hit pause there because it's a good place to end it because um, coming up next, we are going to talk about executives and how they are responding to this risk environment and that touches on that relationship with insurers. Manisha, you are leaving us at this point. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank but you so much, Brandon. Sure. But uh, viewers, please stay tuned because after the break, Simon and I are joined by SHA Risk Specialist Underwriting Head of Financial Lines and Compliance, Taboko Leshilo, as we unpack how executives are responding to this risk landscape. So don't go anywhere.